Hello, I'm Dave Hart. I'm the preacher for the Winslow, Arizona Church of Christ, and I'm so glad you've chosen to join me today. Today we're going to look at the fourth in our series of what the Church of Christ is not. Um, and if you haven't watched the three before this one, I really hope that you'll go back and do so. But we're looking at things the Church of Christ is not. We know the Church of Christ is many, 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 many wonderful and great things. It is the kingdom of God. It's the Lord's church. It's the people of God. All those th wonderful, wonderful things. But there's also some things that the Church of Christ is not. And we're going to look at a couple more of those today. So let's go ahead and start out. And the first one we're going to look at is the Church of Christ is not optional. The Church of Christ is not optional. You know, we hear so many times today out on Christian radio and various places that uh, they'll tell us to join the church of our choice. Go to the church of your choice. Just find a church that, that, that you choose. Well, as we said from an earlier lesson, in this series, I don't want to go to a church that I choose. I want to go to the church that God chooses. And if we are going to be saved, we're going to be God's people. It's not an option. We have to go to his church. And how do we know that it's his church? We know because it's going to teach and practice and say and do what the scripture says without adding it, without taking away, without changing it. Or, or doing any of those kind of things. So we have people out there that want to just choose their own church, even start their own church. Boy, I think there's a new church started almost every day anymore. And you can look out in some of these denominational groups. Like last time I looked, and it's been quite a few years, so I'm sure there's more than that. There was like almost 200 different types of Baptist groups and just the Baptist, and there was several different kind of Methodist, and on and on and on. So there again, why, why are they different? Why are they called different things? Well, they're called different things because they all teach different things. They all practice and believe different things. I just seen this week, and um, I got it pasted up on my Facebook page to... to um, to show where some of these churches are going, a Methodist church was inviting a, a um, transgender person to come in and to teach at their church. And I mean, just crazy stuff, crazy stuff. No, we want, we want the church of God's choice. There are also those people out there that say, well, I don't need to go to an organized religion. I don't need to be part of a church. I can go out to the woods or worship God at home alone and all that kind of stuff. Now, there, there could be a situation where you'd have to worship God alone. Maybe you're a shut-in or you're sick or, or providentially you're not able to be with the brotherhood. But God has always called his people together. God has always called his people together. Uh, throughout, the, 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 throughout the different ages, the periodical age, he called families together to worship. During the Mosaic age, he called all the Jews together to worship. During the Christian age, he calls all the Christians to meet together and to um, worship him and to fellowship and to encourage one another. So we have to understand that if we are going to be a Christian and we're going to be saved, being a part of the Church of Christ is not an option, is not an option. And, and meeting together, and meeting together, to worship God is also not an option. Let's look at Hebrews 25 and 26. Hebrews 25 and 26. Not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together, as is the matter of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. For if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. Scary passages here, and and, and we won't go into it um, today, but if you keep reading, if you keep reading Hebrews past verse 26, it gets even scarier. And it's talking about here forsaking the assembly of ourselves together. Is it a sin to do so? Yes, because this is a command from God. Listen to what it says again, not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together. Now, 
Forsaking means that you could have been there and you've chosen not to. You could have been there and you've chosen not to. There are reasons that you may not be able to attend. There are situations that occur, can occur that you may not be able to attend. attend. If you're sick, listen, if you're sick, I tell my congregation, I'm one that believes that you need to be at every service, morning, evening, and Bible studies when we call the whole church together. I believe it is sinful and wrong to not do so. But if you're sick, stay home. Keep your bugs to yourself. Okay, I know some people think, oh, I'm being very noble coming and, and, and coughing and sneezing and getting everybody else sick. And, and, um, and, and, you, and you may be young and strong and healthy, but you may kill an older person. So, yeah, you know, there's, there's, there's reasons to miss if you're a shut-in. If you have a job that you, can, that you have to work. Some, some Christians are police officers and they'd have to work during some of the service times and some are nurses and, and various things like that. Now, I believe that um, if, you are, if you do have a job that you have to work during service times, you need to do the best that you can to try and be at as, as many services as you can. And if you're able to change your hours or whatever, you certainly do that. But I know Christians who choose to work, to choose to work, they don't have to work. They, they choose to do overtime or they choose to work on Sunday because they get more money or, or, or whatever. There again, that's, that's, that's wrong. That's forsaking the assembly. And it is a sin to do so. And some say, well, um, is, is it a sin just to miss one assembly? Well, how many assemblies do you have to miss before it becomes a sin? It says forsake. Any time we forsake, I know when I was younger and in my early twenties, there was times that I forsake the assembly, and it wasn't for a, a, a reason; it was an excuse, and it was sinful and it was wrong, and I have repented of that. So we're not to forsake the assembly of ourselves together, as is the manner of some. See, they they had a problem in the early church, and it's the same problem we have today. There's some people who forsake the assembly. Every church I've been at, every church I've worked at, there's always some that forsake the assembly. They're able to be there. They're able to be in the evening service, and they've chosen not to. Now, now listen, we have here, just as a good chance you do in your congregation, we have some people that can't come back on Sunday night because they can't see well enough to come back. They've gotten older, and and their eyesight isn't good enough to come back. There again, that's a reason. There's a big difference between a reason and excuse. God accepts reasons. He does not accept excuses. So they had, as a matter of some, they had some, some in the early church who were forsaking the assembly. And it goes on to say, but exhorting one another. So this is one of the reasons we come together is to exhort to encourage, to build up, to strengthen one another. And there's so much that goes on uh, during the worship service and after the worship service when we're together and we can uh, learn about prayer needs and we can learn about um, physical needs of the, of the church and financial needs of the church and spiritual needs of the, uh, of, of the church and all kinds of things, all kinds of important things. And... Uh, for me, and I've heard other people say the same thing, if I have to miss a service, let's say I'm sick and I have to miss a service, uh, the whole week just seems off to me. It, it does. It just seems like it's, it's, it, there's something off about it. And we get what I call our spiritual batteries recharged. Listen, just like a, a, a regular battery, it, it gets drained over time. It gets drained over time. And we get the same thing being Christians. We're out in the world and we have to um, deal with worldly things and worldly people. And it drains our batteries down, drains our spiritual batteries down. And we get it recharged when we come together and fellowship and worship the Lord. And it's how we're to worship God. There again, some people say, well, I can do that at home or nature. Well, you may be able to, but that's, you're still disobeying God's command because he says to meet together, meet together. I've had people ask me, I know there was a man who was um, 
over in the Middle East working, and he was the only Christian, and and he had to be real careful about it because it was a Muslim country, and it could mean trouble if it got out that he was trying to evangelize and things. So it had to be quiet about. It. So he he had to worship by himself. He'd have his own service and and do his own thing. And 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 there again, there are circumstances like that where you might have to worship alone. I've known shut-ins doing the same thing during COVID. During the, that time, me and my wife worshiped together when when there was issues with people of COVID in the church, and we had to shut it down for a little bit. And um, uh, so there are reasons, there are reasons, but we better be sure it's a real legitimate reason, not an excuse. Otherwise, we're to be together, exhorting one another. And it says so much, uh, and so much more as you see the day approaching. What's the day that's approaching here? Well, uh, there's three main ideas with that. Uh, one idea is the day approaching meant the day that Jerusalem was going to be destroyed, that uh, General Titus was going to come in and they were going to you know, wipe out the Jews and have no problem with that meaning. Another meaning is we see the day, of the, the day where the Lord's coming back, the second coming of the Lord as we call it. I have no problem with that. And uh, others believe that the day approaching is the day of our death because we all have that day coming. If the Lord doesn't come back first, we all have that day approaching. And, and I'm fine with all of those because I think they all fit with the passage here. As we see the day, as time goes on, as each day goes by, it's another day we're closer to dying or the Lord coming back. And we better be ready. We better be doing what God says. And one of the things he says that's an, that's an absolute command is to assemble. Sometimes you might have people who say, well, where does the Bible say we have to go to church? Now, some people don't like that terminology, church, going to church. I don't really, I, I used to, but I don't really have a problem because when I looked into the word ecclesia, which, which is, is, is the, um, the original language, it means the called out, or the called to. It also means the called to. And, and what's church? Well, we're, we're called to come to worship. We know, or at least we should, I hope we do, we know the church isn't the building. Church isn't a building. The church isn't a place. The church is the people. And the people are called out and they're called to come together. So some people say, well, where does the Bible say we have to kind of go to church or to meet or, or you know, the, that kind of stuff or right here. This passage is there again, a command from God, not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together as is, a, as is the matter of son. Now down in verse 26, and there again, if, if you um, want to, and I think that you should, it would be a good idea to take this passage out and keep reading down below that. But it says, for if we sin willfully, what does that mean? If we, if we sin willfully, after we know the truth, if we do or don't do what it says to do, then we are sinning willfully. Well, if you're listening to me, I just read the Bible. It says, don't forsake the assembly. So if you, if you forsake the assembly, not for a reason, but, but you forsake it for an excuse, you are sinning willfully. For if we sin willfully after we've received the knowledge of the truth, this is the truth, go up there and check these passages, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sin. That's scary, folks. That's scary. God takes us coming together seriously. It is a serious, serious matter. And I'm afraid there's so many out there, even, even some in the Church of Christ, that don't see it as such. They don't believe it's a sin to miss worship service. They think it's a, it's a you can do it or, or you don't have to do it or if there's nothing better to do or, or I don't have to go to all the services. Notice what it says up here. It says the assembling, the assembling of ourselves together, not the assembly, not the assembly, the assembling. What, what does that mean? That means whenever, whenever the church calls everyone to come together, everyone that is able to be there, able to be there needs to be there different churches have different leaderships who have different times um, during the week appointed 
we here in, in the Winslow, we, we call everybody to come to morning worship service, and then we have a Bible study after our worship service, and then we have an evening service uh, for worship, and then we have a Wednesday night Bible study time, and that's when we call the whole church to come together. And there again, as long as providentially you're not able to be there, you need to be there, you need to be there. So if we sin willfully after we receive the knowledge of the truth, then it no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. So God said, you don't go to church, there's no, there's no sacrifice for your sins. Now that's what it's saying here. There's no way to get around it. Oh, I've seen people try to get around it and do somersaults about it and everything else, just like they do about the necessity of baptism and so many other subjects. But there's no way around it. There's no way around it after you, after you know the truth that you're not to forsake the assembly. To, to forsake it is to sin, and it, and it makes the sacrifice of the blood of Jesus of no effect upon your life. So it's a serious matter. Remember, when, remember what this topic is? The Church of Christ is not an option. It's not an option. Now, if you want to be saved, now, if you want to be right with God... Acts 2, verse 41. Acts 2, verse 41. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized. And that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. So, what's this? how do we get added to this church? It's not an option. Well, the Bible tells us here we must be baptized. We must be baptized. We can't, we can't get into the church any other way. Oh, some people say just by faith, I just have to have faith, and, and that's not what the Bible says. It says you're at it when you are baptized. I have one guy my, that's on, um, making comments in my Facebook ministry recently, and he's saying, oh, baptism in the Bible isn't water baptism. I don't, I don't know what the baptism he thinks it is. I don't know if he thinks it's Holy Spirit baptism, which, which only happened twice in the Bible. Or, or some kind of weird spiritual baptism. I don't know, but, but, but baptism that it's talking about here, and there's only one baptism now, right? One Lord, one faith, one baptism. The baptism that we have today and that this is talking about is water baptism. Water baptism, and that's how we are put into the church. Listen, you go to you can go to worship service, you can go to every Bible study the church has every day of your life, the rest of your life. You can do good deeds, you can read your Bible every day, say prayers for hours. If you're not put into his church, you're still not saved. And the way you do it is by being baptized. The same way they did it is the same way we do it. The Bible doesn't change. Old man wants it to change and tries to do everything they can to change it. I remember seeing a while back uh, about um, a certain Bible, the Revised Standard Version, New Revised Standard Version, and... Uh, some of the people who worked on it said, well, next time we do it, we're going to have to update it and make some things that are very sinful, according to the Bible, not look so sinful because the culture's changed. No. No, the Word of God stays the same. The things that God says that are sinful then, when the Bible was first written, are still sinful today. And the way that we're put into the church on the day of Pentecost is still the same way. You know, it, it's, it's funny because I read a page out of the Baptist manual this last week or two. Baptist manual. You know, a lot of Baptists don't even know there's a Baptist manual, but there is. There's a Baptist. You don't believe me? Go, go Google it. Go look on the Internet and you can, you can find the Baptist manual. And the Baptist manual <laughs> said that when the church first started, I'm paraphrasing here, that you were baptized in order to be put into it, but it's not that way anymore. <laughs> Isn't that funny? Isn't that funny that some Baptist has just decided that the Bible isn't that way anymore? No, we're, 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 we gladly receive the Word of God, we're baptized, then we are added to the church. We are added to the church. Remember, the church is not an option. The church is not an option. Acts 2, verse 47. Acts 2, verse 47 says, Praising God and having favor of all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. 
uh, it is the Lord that adds you to the church. It's the Lord that adds you to the church there. Again, you're not voted in. You know, there's those out there that, that vote people into the church. And um, I had kind of some fun with that the other week here because we was talking about that. And I mentioned one of our members here. His name's Wayne. And yeah, it's like Wayne. You know, we'd vote. He said, mm, I don't know about Wayne. I don't know if we want him in this church or not. And uh, we may not vote him in. And anyway, we was having some fun with it. Uh, but, but, but we have nothing to do. Listen, we have nothing to do with putting people into the church. That's not our place. That's not our business. We, our business is to give people the instructions so they can be placed into the church by the Lord. It is the Lord. It's only the Lord that adds people to the church, and it's only the Lord that take, it can take people out of the church. It's his church. That's his place. That's his duty, and none of us can do that other than him. None of us. Some might say, well, what about disfellowshipping? You know, the Bible tells us disfellowship people, which, which puts people out of the church. Well, it's still not us that did that. Yes, we obey the commands to do that when it becomes necessary. But then if it's necessary, we've done it the right way, we've done it the biblical way. The Lord honors that. The Lord would have us to do that. And it's still him that will put the person outside of the, outside of the church, outside of the group. So there again is the Lord that adds those who are being saved. And he does that after you're baptized because, because baptism is when sins are washed away. Until you're baptized, if you are an adult with a normal functioning brain, I always, always like to say a normal functioning brain because there are some people who um, will, will never have that. They have some kind of defect and they'll never be able to understand the scriptures and right from wrong and stuff. Those people, those people are always safe. But somebody with a normal functioning brain, at the, at the point of age of accountability, they sin, and it's only the blood, it's only the blood, only the blood of Jesus that gets sin out. And you read all through scriptures, there's always been blood, right? The patriarchal age, they, they, there was blood, there was, there was sacrifices of animals. In the mosaic age, sometimes they sacrificed thousands of animals in one day. It, it was always blood. And of course, we know that, that blood, that blood, they had to do that and for obedience but it, it um, ultimately just put off, it ultimately just put off the, the real cleansing, which happened at Jesus' death, right? But the blood of Jesus went forwards and went backwards. And, um, and those who were obedient, who did do those animal sacrifices, also were washed with the blood of Jesus, just as we are now, and we've got to come in contact with that blood. How do we do that? It's through baptism. Baptism represents the blood of Jesus, represents his death. We're buried with him into that bloody grave. And, and we, we rise again in new creation with the blood of Jesus having washed away all of our sins. And at that point, at that point, the Lord puts us into his church. We don't have to be voted on, uh, you know, or anything like that. He just does that. That is the process. That's what's, what happens. And if we or, or uh, any denominational group out there says differently, they're wrong. They're wrong, and they're trying to do what's God's business. And that's not, that's not our business when it comes to that. Oh, there's God's business. That's, that's our business also. But that's not one of them. It's the Lord that puts somebody into the church once they've come in contact with his blood through the waters of baptism. Revelation 21, verse 2. Revelation 21, verse 2. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. So we must be the church. That's not optional. We must also be the bride of Christ. We must also be the bride of Christ. The, 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 the church is the bride, and... Uh, one of the things that's important for us to always understand is that the Lord puts the bride into our hands and he expects us to protect her. He expects us to take care of her. 
Many, many years ago now, I worked at a, at a um, gym. And at this gym, the owner of the gym, he had a time um, when he would be there early in the morning and then he would leave in the evening and I would manage the gym in the evening. And his wife was the bookkeeper. And she would come in and do the books for a few hours and go home. And one of the things he always told me was be sure that she gets into her car safely every night. You know, just like most places, there was things that happened and and issues. And, and I remember one poor girl at the gym, oh, she was a lovely young lady and had a little crush on her back then. And, and uh, she worked at a laundromat. And one night somebody came into that laundromat and he had a, a ball ping hammer and he hit her in the head and did all kinds of brain damage and stuff and that poor little girl she never was right after that uh, not totally and, um, and I used to have to do the same thing with her when she'd leave the gym uh, uh, escort her out to be sure she got safely into her car well the, the owner he, he told me to be sure and that his wife got into her car and, and, you know, the car started and, and she got on her way home every night. And, um, and, and, and listen, he, he put his bride into my hands in order to protect her. And when she was done with the bookkeeping, she'd come out and say, okay, I'm, I'm ready to go home now. And I would um, come out from the desk or wherever I was at in the gym when she told me that. And I'd walk her out the door and I'd walk her to her car and I'd stay there and be sure that the car got started and, and it took off and got down the road. And that was the routine that I did for a long time with her. And the whole point of this is the Lord has done the same thing with us. He has put his precious bride into our hands to protect her. Where was I protecting this lady from us protecting her from somebody having his way with her, from somebody robbing her, or just all kinds of things. What are we to do with, with, with the Lord's bride? We're to protect her, not to let filthy men have their way with her. We're not to allow them to put their hands on the bride. We're to keep her pure. We're, we're, we are to protect her. We're not to let false doctrine and false teaching, immorality, and to the church that would dirty and stain the bride. We are to protect her. You know, some people get upset with me because um, I will defend the church. I will speak against denominations because I'm to be a watchman on the wall, as you are. And we're to warn people. We're to warn people. Listen, I'm to warn the Catholic. I'm to warn the Mormon, the Jehovah's Witness, the Muslim, the Hindu, um, the Baptist, the Methodist. Oh, I'm to warn them. I'm to warn everybody. Will they appreciate that warning? Oh, a lot of them won't. A lot of them will get mad and upset and call me a, a, a Pharisee and, and all kinds of things like that. Well, that's okay because I tell you what, I want to go to heaven someday. And I'd, I'd rather have them hate me and call me names and miss heaven because God says if you don't warn the sinful man, he's going to lose his soul and so are you. But at least if you warn them, you will save your own soul and you might just save theirs too. So we need to, to protect the bride. We need to watch out for the bride. We need to care about the bride and keep her pure. Keep her pure. The, the church is also the kingdom. So we got the church, we got the bride, we got the kingdom. Church is also a kingdom. And, and we need to understand that. And maybe it would cause less confusion if we'd call it the kingdom more often because... Because what do we do out here when somebody says, oh, yeah, I go to church. Well, what are you? Well, I'm a Baptist. Well, I'm a Mormon or whatever. What if we said, oh, well, which kingdom do you belong to? Well, the kingdom of God. 
Do you see what I mean? That there's only one kingdom. In order to be part of that one kingdom, you've got to be part of the one church, the Church of Christ. You've got to be the bride of Christ. So, so we have a kingdom. We have a form of government in this kingdom, don't we? We have elders and deacons and preachers and teachers, members. And uh, kingdoms are to expand and to grow. It's good for a kingdom to expand and to grow, and that's what we do. Kingdoms make war, and we're constantly at war, are we not, with, with Satan and evil and ungodliness and false teaching, all that kind of thing. So, we're the church, we're the bride, we're the kingdom. Revelation 21, verse 9. Revelation 21, verse 9. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls filled with the seven last plagues came to me and talked with me, saying, Come, I will show you the bride, the Lamb's wife. So there again, we're called the Lamb's wife, we're called the, the Jesus' wife. And one thing that the Bible teaches us is that the, the wife is to do what the husband says. Ooh, I know some of you ladies may not like that, but, but that's what the Bible teaches. Listen, ladies, and um, um, uh, this is hard, I can understand, but you are to do what your husband says unless it goes against the will of God. We're never to do anything that goes against the will of God, no matter who says it. But, but you might say, but my husband's an idiot. You know, my husband wants to sell everything and move to wherever. And, and you know, um, don't matter. Now, now listen, the husband is supposed to love the wife and do what's best for her and be caring and stuff. Some husbands aren't, unfortunately, but they're supposed to be. But even if they're not, unless it goes against the will of God, I know this is hard stuff, but this is what the Bible teaches. Wives are to obey the husband. And same thing with the church, the bride. We are to obey everything the Lord says. So it don't matter if we don't like it or not. It don't matter if we don't think that it's right or not. We still have to obey the husband. We have to obey Jesus and do what Jesus says. If we don't, if we don't, we're not going to be the Church of Christ anymore. All may say Church of Christ outside, but that don't mean it's going to be the Church of Christ inside. And, and listen, that's what I'm talking about here when I say Church of Christ, because, because we know there's churches out there that, that have Church of Christ on the door, but they're really nothing at all to do with the true church. And how do you know? How do you know that the true church? Well, if they're preaching and practicing and, and obeying what the Word of God says, we know it's the true Church of Christ. If not, then we know that it's not. So we all should be searching for the true Church of Christ. We all should be building up the Church of Christ. We all should be defending it. And we should be keeping it pure. And we should understand that it is the church. It is the bride. It is the kingdom. There's only one. And it's not an option. It's not an option. You want to be faithful to the Lord. Okay, let's move on to the next one here. Uh, this is, we're going to look at, the Church of Christ is not a newcomer to the world of churches. The Church of Christ is not a newcomer to the world of churches. I, as I said earlier, there seems to be new churches springing up almost every day. But as a matter of fact, the Church of Christ is the oldest church in the world. It is the only church spoken of in the New Testament. Let me, let me repeat that. As a matter of fact, the Church of Christ is the oldest church in the world. It's the only church spoken of in the New Testament. It bore the name Church of Christ from the very beginning. It bore the name, and we'll see that as, as we look through some of the scriptures here. It bore the name Church of Christ from the very beginning. And listen... Uh, you might look up Wikipedia or something like that and might say that the Catholic Church was the first church, but that, that's a lie. Now, the, the, the true church eventually apostatized, perverted into the Catholic Church. 
It didn't happen overnight. It happened a little piece at a time. You can look at the different things that they brought in, sprinkling, mariology, and on and on. These things happened over many years until they, they perverted or apostatized to the point that it was no longer the Church of Christ. It was no longer the original church. But the Church of Christ is the original church. It's a church that you find in Acts. It's the Lord's church. And is the oldest. Listen, you can go and you can find, and I have several charts of this, where you can find where people started different churches, different different denominations that, that, that are out there. And, um, uh, you know, most of them happened many, 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 many hundreds of years after the true church, after the true church. But the Church of Christ was the original, was the church that... Um, uh, that is the original church of the Lord. Jude 3 says, Jude 3 says, Beloved, why is very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation? I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. All that was said about the church and how it was to operate and what was to be done was... Um, uh, put into the scriptures before the scriptures were done. Jude 3 tells us that. So we can look out there at all these other groups that are out there. We, we can look at, at the Catholics and look at their authority sources. as well. They, they have the Bible as one, but they've also added books to the Bible. They have the Apocrypha, which, which were not in the original scriptures. These, these, were, out. these were not seen as scriptures. Uh, you know, they were written between the Old and the New Testament, and, and they were not put into the, They were not ever seen as scriptures in the days of Jesus. They were added. So they added things here that were not scriptural. Uh, the, the Church of Christ, I mean, the, the Catholic Church also has tradition. They say the tradition of the Catholic Church is just as valid as the scriptures are. So they've added and changed things through their traditions. They also say the Pope is an authority source that he speaks for God on earth, and they're allowed to change things just because maybe the Pope has indigestion that day or whatever he wants, wants to do or, or thinks about doing. And then we look out here at uh, so many of these denominational groups. I talked earlier about the Baptist manual. The Baptists have a manual, so they have the Bible and a Baptist manual. The Methodist has the Bible and, and their book. They have things called the Method. Seventh-day Adventists have the Bible and the writings of Ellen G. White. The Mormons have the Book of Mormon and Pearl Great Price and these other books. Um, the Pentecostals, they have the Bible and then extra biblical knowledge, extra biblical knowledge outside of the Bible. In other words, they still believe the Holy Spirit is still speaking to them and telling them things. And, and uh, they may, may, might not do that so much if they would go by the Old Testament when it comes to a prophet, right? Because the Old Testament said that if a prophet that prophesies and it doesn't come about, you're not to listen to him and you're to put him to death. You're to put him to death. And I remember I had some friends that were in, in the Pentecostal church and, and they told me about their grandpa they respected very much and they said that they prophesied over his grandpa and they said that he wouldn't die until the Lord came back. Prophesied that was, that was um, put on, upon him. And the grandpa's been dead for quite a few years now, and the Lord still hasn't come back. And then there's groups out there that have um, their, their little meetings that they have, and they put, send delegates, and they vote on things. Uh, this is one of the things that the Methodists have done they recently, voted on if homosexuality should be allowed in the church or not. You have living apostles in Salt Lake City that makes decisions based upon them being apostles and not the scriptures. You have the Watchtower and Tract Society back in New York. There again, that, that makes predictions and, 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 um, and doctrine based upon what they believe, not what the scriptures are saying. And we go on and on and on. 
so these churches, they, they have other authority sources. We are only to have one authority source, and that is the scriptures, which was once and for all delivered to the saints when the last book of the Bible was written, when the last book of the Bible was written. There's nothing new, nothing to be changed, nothing added, nothing taken away. And that's what the true Church of Christ does. It tries the best that it can to stay as close to the Bible and do exactly what it says. When the Bible says to do something, we try to do it. When the Bible says not to do something, we do our best not to do it without adding or taking away or changing regardless of culture. And that can be a really hard thing, right? We see things change in our culture. We, we see things, we, we can look at transgenderism, which is such a, 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 seems to be growing in popularity and they're mutilating young children, all kinds of things. And, and when I was a kid, you just seen one of these kind of people as being nuts, as being crazy, as being off their rock, or needed a mental institution, or needed some medicine or something. And now we see a lot of people trying to accept these people as being legitimate, that, that you know, God made a mistake and put them in the, in the wrong body. And, and listen, I'm telling you something, folks. God doesn't make a mistake. If, if you were created as a boy, you were supposed to be a boy. If you were created as a girl, you are supposed to be a girl. And what is so sad is that these people, they, 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 they hate themselves so much they can't even accept that. They're, they're living without God. They don't know God. They don't understand God. And they don't understand the precious gifts that God has given them to either being a male or a female and, and all that kind of stuff. But culture's changing. Their idea's changing. Uh, a lot of people don't see it how we would have seen it when I was young. But the Bible is still the same thing. You're a man or you're a woman. A woman's not to dress like a man, and a man's not to dress like a woman. And God tells us that very directly, very directly. So the same thing with practices of, of worship. We're to do what God says when it comes to worship. We're to sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, not adding entertainment, um, not adding the guitar or the drum or the kazoo or the play the jug or whatever it is that you want to do. We, we're not to do that. We're to stay with what God says. And, and we're to um, not have, uh, you know, dancing girls. I know churches that have dancing girls with flags. Or I know one church, they had a, we call it a dance in the spirit where this guy got out on a leotard and danced around. And, and no, we're not to do that. We're to sing psalms and spiritual songs. We're to have the Lord's Supper. We're to have the Lord's Supper on the first day of the week. And, and we're to have it every week. And we see churches out there, there again, once a year, twice a year, once a quarter. Uh, where do they get that at? The Bible says they met on the first day of the week to break bread. We're to have a sermon. We're not to have a dramatic presentation or, or something of that nature. We're to, to have a sermon. We're to pray prayers and sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs unto the Lord. And the Bible is very clear that it is only men who are to lead. It's only men who are to lead. And we see more and more women leading the church out there, don't we? Leading the, the, in the pulpit and becoming elders even and, and all kinds of things, even happening in the Lord's church. Shameful, shameful. So uh, the Lord's church can always always be regenerated. What do I mean by that? Well, see, when these people start denominations, it's usually based on men or a group of men who come up with their own ideas, their own thoughts that are outside of Scripture. But the Church of Christ, we take the Bible, and, and the Bible is the seed. We plant the seed, and we grow the church. We grow the church. We don't put in other seeds. We don't mix other seeds in there. It's just the scripture, not man's ideas or a group, different groups' ideas. We just plant the scriptures. That means that we can take the Bible and we can go any place in this whole world and start the Lord's church. And start the Lord's church. The, the, the Church of Christ could even cease to exist. It could cease to exist for a hundred years, for a thousand years. And then somebody could, could 
take the Bible, go back to the Bible, do what it says, and we could have the Church of Christ again. The Church of Christ is the oldest church. The true Church of Christ is going to do the best they can to do exactly about adding or taking away what the Scripture says to do. Romans 16, 16 says, Greet one another with a holy kiss. The churches of Christ greet you. So there again, we see the name from the start, from the beginning of the church, from, the, from when the Bible was written. They were called Churches of Christ. They were called Churches of Christ, and any single location would be the Church of Christ, right? So we see this is a biblical name. And we want to be sure we have a biblical name to the church. Why would you name your church after John the Baptist? Why would you name your church after John Calvin or, um, um, or, or Luther or any of these other names that they have out there? I don't know. We're to name the church after its owner. We're to name the church. Remember we said earlier that Christ is the husband who doesn't the wife. And I, and I understand this day and age sometimes the wife doesn't, but it isn't normal and right for the wife to take the husband's name. So... We are the Church of Christ. We, we belong to Christ. Why do we want to belong to anybody else? Why do we want to name the church something else? And You know, I almost laugh at some of these churches out here. I mean, they have a name that's two or three lines long. And it's the Reformed um, uh, Pentecostal Baptist Southern. La, 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 la. Why, why don't you just call it what the Bible calls it, the Church of Christ? And I understand it's also called the Church of God or or um, um, the Lord's Church. There could be various other names that are just as biblical, but it's the Lord's Church, the Church of Christ. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13. 13. For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greek, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one Spirit. So there again, as we talked about earlier, Church of Christ is the oldest church. It's the first church. It's the church that belongs to Christ. And in order to enter that church, you must, you must be baptized. You must be baptized for the remission of your sins. I understand out there that, that pretty much every Christian group that I know of baptizes Pretty much every Christian group out there baptizes, but pretty much all of them get it wrong. We have some out there that sprinkle. I think you just can, can sprinkle some water on somebody and they're baptized. That's not baptism. Baptism is, is to be put under, to be pickled, to be immersed. And we, of course, in the Lord's Church, we try to be sure that we do that. And sometimes that could be harder than other times because sometimes when you put somebody back to be baptized... If you're not careful, they, they stick a leg up while, while everything else is under the water. No, we want to get, a, get them all under the water, buried under the water, buried in, into the grave of Christ. And then there's those out there that, that, that have the right um, mode of baptism. Oh, they, they baptize uh, correctly as far as putting them under the water, but they're not baptizing for the correct reason. No, it has to be for the right reason. So what, what does the Bible say it's for? It says it's for the remission of sins. It's for the remission of sins. And it's, it's for salvation. It's to be put into the church. You're not put into the church until you're baptized. So they'll say stuff like you should do it for obedience and it's an outward sign of an inward experience and all kinds of nonsense like that. But they'll tell you you don't have to be baptized and it has nothing to do with salvation. And I've always said, you know, and always thought when, when somebody tells me that, well, then why would I want to do it? I say it's for obedience. But you just said I don't have to do it. And I'm just to say before as I am afterwards, why would I want to go get wet? Why do it? And they're like, oh, 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 no, no, why do it? You just told me I'm just a saved and I don't have to do it. Why should I do it? Why should I do it? Well, I'll tell you why I did it. I did it because 
I was taught the scriptures, and the scripture says you got to be baptized to be saved. And I knew that I wanted to be obedient to Jesus Christ. And I didn't do it for an outward experience. I didn't do it because I was already saved. I didn't do it just just for obedience, even though obedience, yes, I did do it for obedience, but but not how they're using obedience. Um, because there again, they're saying that, that this is a unnecessary obedience. I understood it was a necessary obedience. And when I was put under the water at 12 years old, I understood that I was going to become a Christian. That I was going to do and, 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 uh, and, and be what the Lord wanted me to be and do what the Lord wanted me to do. To become part of the Church of Christ the oldest church, the only church that's talked about in the Bible and the only church that the Lord recognizes. Oh, some people get all puffed up and hurt feelings and and mad at that, but you know what? It's what the scripture teaches. You will find the Church of Christ. I just read to you where it says the Church of Christ right there in the Bible. You tell me where it says the Presbyterian Church, the Baptist Church, the Catholic Church, the Mormon Church, the Pentecostal, any of those other churches. You show me where they're in the Bible. Show me. I'll show you where the Church of Christ is at in the Bible. Not only the name Church of Christ, but the actions of the Church of Christ. The actions of of, of the Church of Christ. It is the original one and only church. We have a lot of ripoffs out there, don't we? It can be all kinds of things that the, the original is the original, and then you have all kinds of ripoffs. You have counterfeits. You have people with money, right? They counterfeit money, and, and some of them, you know, get it very, very close, almost exactly to what the original looks like, but it's always a little bit off, isn't it? And there's a lot of churches out there, and some of them are way off. Some of them are monopoly money. But, but other churches can get very, very close. But what happens if you take a $100 bill that's very, 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 very close and try and spend it, and, they, and are they going to accept it if they know that it's not the real thing? And you can say, but it's so close, and it looks like it, and, 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 and all that, but it's not real. It's not real money. It, it can be very close, but it's not real. And it will not be accepted. And what happens if you try and use it? You're going to get in trouble. You're going to go to jail. What if you were in a counterfeit church? Oh, it may look like a church and it may even be very close. Maybe a lot of things that are very close to the real and true church. But it's not the real thing. Still not teaching everything, not practicing everything the scripture commands us to do. What's going to happen when we meet God someday? And we say, but God, it was very close, but it wasn't his church. It was a counterfeit and you're going to jail. You're going to jail. No, we want to be in the original, the true church. We want to be in the right church. It's okay to be right. You know, in this day and age, they want to make you think it's almost a sin to be right. Well, because everybody's supposed to be right, right? And there is no wrong. It's not true. There's right and there's wrong. And that includes the church. And listen, I'm, I'm telling you this out of love. Because I want you to be in the right church. I want you to go to heaven. And, and listen, you don't even have to take my word for it. Study. That's what I did. That's what I did many years ago. I wanted to be sure I was in the right church. There's so many people that won't do that. Oh, no. They, they go to a church and they feel comfortable there. They like the minister. They like the building. They like the, the singing. They, they have friends there. Uh, and, and they don't search these things out. Well, I did because I want to go to heaven. I searched them out and, and I studied with these people churches believed and I studied what the church of Christ believes and I study them by comparing them to what the Bible says if you don't believe me do this yourself because I tell you what there's not a church out there that I could find that was even close to where the church of Christ was when it comes to obeying the scriptures some were closer than others 
but none of them held a candle to the Lord's church, to the church of Christ. And that's the church that I want to be in. I know some people are like, well, I've been a you know, fifth generation this or fourth generation that, and my grandpa was such a good Christian, my grandma was so loving, she wasn't in the Church of Christ. Is that going to be your excuse when you stand before God? And rather, if they were right or wrong or whatever, they didn't want you to be right with God. They didn't want you to be right with God. They didn't want you to do right. They didn't want you to be in heaven, even if they were mistaken. And we let God be that judge, don't we? But, but, but what we do is up to us. What we do is up to us. So the Church of Christ is not optional, and the Church of Christ is not a newcomer, but the Church of Christ is the Lord's Church, Church of the Bible, the Kingdom of God, and the Bride of Christ. If you're watching this today and you are not a Christian, you haven't been baptized in the correct way, and of course we know there's some steps you got to take before you're baptized, right? you got to hear God's Word, as you've, as you've heard today. You've got to believe it, have faith in it. It's impossible to please God without faith. You must repent of your sins. Repentance is all over the scriptures. Repentance is turning from your sins, turning away, being sorry from you, for your sins, asking God to forgive you of your sins, making your sins right if you're able to. We're not always able to do that, but, but if you stole your neighbor's cow, you got to give it back, don't you? And then we got to confess, make the good confession that Jesus Christ is the Son of God before man and God. And then we have the baptism that we talked about, where you are baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit for the remission of your sins. And, and, and you go into that water, a dirty, rotten sinner, with all your sin clinging to you. But you come up pure, you come up covered with the blood of Jesus, you put on Jesus like a coat, and everything you've ever done is washed away. And then we're going to remain faithful until we die or the Lord comes. And then we have that wonderful promise of heaven. If you haven't done that, please, please find a Church of Christ in your area. Go talk to the minister. Go worship with them. Go to their Bible studies. Get in contact with them. Tell them that you want to be a Christian. Maybe you've been away from the church for a while. You've, for, for whatever reason, you've gotten lazy or you even got mad at the church. That's not God's fault. Go back. Go back. Go be part of that wonderful body. Of Christ. If you're watching this church, if you're watching this sermon today, because maybe as we talked about earlier, providentially you're not able to be at, at worship service um, on Sunday, and you're using this for your sermon. Maybe you're a shut-in, you're sick, um, uh, some other reason that you're not able to meet and, and um, have fellowship, your brothers and sisters. Don't forget your other acts of worship. This can be your sermon, but don't forget to take the Lord's Supper, to pray prayers unto the Lord, um, to give the offering unto the Lord, and to take the Lord's Supper. And I just want to thank you for watching today. If you know of anybody that would benefit or would enjoy watching this video, please share it with them. God bless you.